Okay, thank you for joining us today. Just a few quick reminders before we get started. All attendees are muted. If you are using the event app, we encourage you to check into the session, update your activities, and be sure to complete the session survey at the end. This session is TLP white and is being recorded. Recordings will be available within 24 hours via the app. And with that, I would like to introduce you to your session moderator, Graciela Martinez. Over to you, Graciela. Thank you. Hi. Good morning. Good afternoon and good evening, wherever you are. Welcome to the conference. Um, thank you for joining the session, Cert Capacity in the Petroleum Sector of the North Sea. Your speaker will be Mary Mo, Senior Security Consultant, Threat Intelligence and Incident Response at Mnemonic, Norway. Dr. Mary Mo recently joined Mnemonic as a Senior Consultant in Threat Intelligence and Incident Response. Before this, she was a Senior Scientist and Research Manager for the InfoSec Research Group at Sintef. She is also an associate professor at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology, where she teaches a class on incident response. She has experience as a team leader at the Norwegian Cybersecurity Center, NORCERT, where she did incident handling of cyber attacks against Norway critical infrastructures. So Marie, you can go on. Thank you so much for the introduction. Let me see if I can get this uh, screen sharing uh, working. Just a moment. That looks correct, I think. Um, yes. yes looks good. And also looking into the correct camera. Okay, here we are. So I'm really happy uh, to speak at this virtual edition of the first conference, uh, which is one of my favorite conferences. Uh, I really think the first community uh, of incident responders is amazing. Uh, this is actually the fifth time I'm presenting at the first conference, so it's a pleasure to be here. Today I'm going to talk about uh, search capacity in the petroleum sector of the North Sea. Uh, so this uh, presentation uh, is uh, based on a study uh, that I was uh, involved in doing uh, in my previous role. Uh, the study addressed uh, the search capacity among various actors in the industry, uh, in, uh, in the petroleum industry, in handling critical ICT security incidents in industrial control and safety systems, with a focus on operational technology, so-called OT systems. And uh, this report, as you see, is uh, uh, freely available in Norwegian, I'm soon also gonna show you an English version for those of you who don't speak Norwegian. Uh, so it was uh, conducted uh, by Sintef uh, on behalf of the Norwegian uh, Petroleum Safety Authority. And uh, when we started this uh, study, uh, we contacted a lot of uh, different uh, subject area experts uh, and we did the in-depth interview with, interviews with them. Uh, interviews lasting up to two hours, I think. And uh, it was a really, uh, it was like a semi-structured interview guide, uh, which means that the interview uh, subjects, they uh, had been given a guideline, but uh, some questions were added during the interview. So we sort of went in that direction where they, they, the, the, the interview subject had their expertise. So when we started the study, um, since I've been uh, uh, part of this uh, CERT community uh, for a while, I also contacted uh, uh, lots of my uh, uh, friends and colleagues in, in this area. And we also got to interview eight subject area experts in the search community, which was uh, 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 international. So we have uh, interviews with uh, uh, people working for response teams, uh, uh, search managers and yeah, uh, all across uh, the industry, but uh, we did not perform any interviews with, uh, with the vendors in this uh, particular study. So here's the Norwegian report uh, that you uh, may read if you understand Norwegian, uh, but there's also an English report. Uh, and this is uh, a, a synopsis uh, as a kind of summary of the, the bigger study, uh, which, uh, which uh, me and uh, some of my uh, colleagues uh, uh, 
wrote and uh, got published uh, in IEEE. So it's more like an academic paper, a short version of the study. And this you can also you can you can get the, the author version of this paper for free if you follow this link. So that's the basis of this talk. And then I added a little bonus uh, material at the end where I'll present a recent case study uh, which uh, illustrates uh, uh, types of incident uh, response and preparedness uh, for for an oil rig uh, platform. So the purpose of this study uh, it was to to provide a snapshot of the current situation. Uh, we wanted to know uh, more about how are incidents managed in this, uh, in this particular uh, sector? Uh, how do the actors collaborate in managing incidents? And uh, what's the current practice for information sharing? And also we, we got to talk about some of the main challenges. So this, is not a, uh, this paper is not a case study or a systematic survey. It's more like a snapshot of the current state of affairs uh, related to how different numbers perceive their current search capacity in the sector and how the different actors experience themselves and each other and uh, also to some extent uh, some pathways for improvement. And when we did um, a search for information uh, on this, uh, we did not find a lot of uh, publications uh, publicly available uh, uh, information on the internet. So. That was also, I mean, why uh, the Petroleum Authority uh, uh, commissioned this, uh, this study uh, to, to gain this knowledge. Uh, I'm not going to go into all the details here, but I'll uh, provide you some highlights. Um, the first thing uh, I want to highlight is uh, one thing you, you might have heard about before, but uh, there's like a common uh, uh, thing uh, that this is something that came up in a lot of the different interviews that we performed. It was the lack of visibility and the lack of uh, you know, ways of having a good view into what actually is going on in the OT systems, not only the IT systems where you have a lot of traditional you know, uh, uh, processes and, uh, and, and tools already. So uh, first of all, uh, there was uh, uh, identified a need for better asset management, uh, better visibility to all of the OT things, uh, also from an IT perspective. So we did interview people that were both uh, working on the IT uh, sector in the in the petroleum uh, sector and also on the OT uh, uh, part. And, uh, and in some cases, those had some varying views on, on the state of the art and, uh, and uh, what they needed more information about. Um, but it was a very common, uh, common, uh, say, complaint. And also, for those that uh, were carrying out monitoring of uh, uh, to look for cybersecurity incidents, uh, they saw there was a uh, challenge with lack of technical information on OT systems. Um, because how does the baseline traffic really look like? Uh, there are, you know, uh, some great standards. Uh, uh, that you can follow specifications about how communication protocols look uh, should look like uh, but then it's not always the case uh, that the vendor implements it exactly as according to the standard so when you actually start looking into the traffic it might not look as you expect it to and this might you know uh, be the be the case of misunderstandings and and uh, some uh, some informants mentioned that the uh, when they put monitoring systems in place, sometimes you know the detected anomal uh, anomalies that uh, weren't really anomalies, uh, but were just uh, the things that were usual on on uh, in the baseline traffic. And in order to you know filter out the noise and and get the tuning right, uh, you need to have all the details of the communication protocols, and their implementation uh, is also needed. So this is a challenge uh, uh, that also needs, uh, you know, uh, some uh, some actions from the vendors uh, and more uh, openness, more uh, more information about how how the different uh, products uh, actually are implemented. And it came up as an issue uh, that the cybersecurity expertise of the suppliers uh, might sometimes not be, you know. Uh, I mean, there's there's not a lot of people that uh, are 
you know, highly experienced and have a deep understanding in cybersecurity in uh, industrial control systems and also incident response. Uh, so we're sort of talking to uh, a small community here. And of course, you can't expect that all the vendors have, you know, all the necessary skills in-house to be able to deal with complicated uh, cybersecurity uh, requests from, from uh, their customers. Uh, this is a direct quote, um, well, translated to English uh, from the report that I want to highlight. So this is one of the interview subjects saying that uh, we are starting to create a document to send to our vendors of ICS systems. This helps us separate the cybersecurity from getting muddled with other parts. And this is to put pressure on manufacturers to focus more on cybersecurity via pro procurement. We want this to be a standard and not something that each individual contractor looks into. So I think this is a great point. I mean, via procurement, we can uh, see a lot of change coming in, in this area. So when you, uh, 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 when new systems are you know, purchased, uh, there's a great opportunity to, to do something about the, the requirements to cybersecurity in the procurement process. And also this is something where uh, the different uh, actors can collaborate more in order to create such a, a common standard for what's the expected level of cybersecurity in oil and gas uh, in the petroleum sector. And then uh, I also want to highlight uh, uh, information sharing because this is you know something an instant response that I'm uh, very passionate about. Uh, there there were some issues uh, that was uh, uh, revealed in the study. So one of the things that came up was that there were some meeting places, but sometimes they were based on personal relationships, which might be uh, problematic. Uh, the larger players that we introduced they had good contact with international communities. Uh, however, the smaller ones they appeared to rely on their security service providers uh, to get you know, the, the required information about cybersecurity threat landscape and so on, and also indicators of compromise sharing. And also we discovered that the, the dedicated tools that are available for information sharing, they are not widely used. And uh, there were some uh, sharing of uh, uh, indicators of compromise, but uh, this information sharing was mainly focused on IT systems and not on OT systems. So that was uh, uh, one gap that we, that we discovered. And also something that actually came up uh, several times was the problem with information overload, where the threat information feeds, they are not really uh, well tailored uh, to the kinds of systems that uh, these uh, interview subjects were, were dealing with. Uh, so for them, uh, th they needed some, some, uh, some tools and processes to help them with uh, singling out the uh, information that was relevant for them and their systems. And also uh, when we asked about the uh, information sharing when it came, came to active uh, incidents, uh, no one actually uh, brought this up. It was only the informants that we talked to in the CERT, international search community that talked about this. So it seems like the actors uh, weren't uh, really um, thinking about the, how they could, you know, by sharing information, uh, help everyone to, to become better defenders. And one more thing that I want to highlight, and that was also one of the things that the uh, Petroleum Safety Authority wanted us to look into was the uh, way that CERT alerts and warnings were put into uh, the, the processes, internal processes, uh, and operationalized. And there was a great variety among the actors uh, to what extent they had operationalized their CERT alerts in their internal processes and tools. Uh, some informants that we talked to, they had had never received a search communication. They didn't know what a search communication typically would look like. And some had uh, also never heard about TLP. So this was uh, something that typically maybe stopped at their IT team and never reached the people working with, uh, with security of, uh, of OT systems. Uh, 
when we talk, when they asked about uh, tools, uh, MIST was actually mentioned uh, several times as a useful platform uh, by several actors. Uh, but there were a few processes, a uh, few companies that had processes for collecting IOCs from their own incidents and sharing them with other actors, as I mentioned. Uh, we also brought up the idea of uh, having an oil cert or an oil ISEC in, in, uh, in Norway. And uh, most of the informants that they uh, welcomed the idea of having an, uh, an ISEC uh, for information sharing. Uh, there were some mixed opinions about uh, whether or not they needed uh, another uh, response uh, community, uh, particularly for their sector. Um, there were concerns about, you know, uh, getting enough people with uh, enough competence to staff such a center. Uh, but the need of a meeting place and a way of sharing information in, that, in an ISEC was welcomed. So what was the... Uh, conclusion of the current search capacity. So this is uh, uh, sort of the 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 high high level conclusion is that the, the informants are relatively satisfied with their own search capacity today, but it's acknowledged that one can always improve. For example, in visibility and in the real time monitoring of cybersecurity and OT system, uh, as mentioned. And there are some special challenges that came up uh, that. Uh, 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 should be looked further into. Uh, one thing uh, was the uh, the awareness uh, in uh, of cybersecurity in governance and management level, uh, which many brought up. And uh, I mean, uh, uh, the common theme here here is that as long as there is not a big incident that has happened and that we can see can create a lot of damage, uh, we don't really get the, the management and governance to 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 uh, give us the necessary budget and funding for this. Uh, since this study has been carried out, however, there was one big case in Norway, uh, which uh, maybe some of you or many of you remember. It was the Norsk Hydro a ransomware uh, incident, uh, which created you know, uh, a big, big cybersecurity incident, a lot of downtime, big, huge costs in, in, in recovery. And uh, this, I think, is something that uh, has created more awareness in the sector. And uh, also another special challenge is the uh, focus on the systematic information sharing. Uh, more, uh, also international collaboration was brought up uh, in terms of information sharing, in terms of uh, the um, problem when you know you have a big uh, multi. Uh, uh, you have a big uh, international uh, cooperation and uh, you have, uh, you know, maybe uh, one CERT team in, in one country, uh, another uh, uh, daughter company in a different country and there's an incident. And do you share that information with your local CERT, national CERT, or do you share it with the, the national CERT where the main office is? Uh, this is something that came up and um, also the need for coordinating and harmonizing cybersecurity in IT and OT systems. And of course, uh, something that also um, uh, is, uh, you know, uh, important here is we need some practical procedures for inf incident response preparedness, because um, many informants, they perceive that when, uh, when security breaches are detected, it may not be possible to even uh, to disconnect or shut down auto systems in the containment phase of the incident response. Uh, for instance, to perform emergency security updates. So I wanted to hold on, hold on to that thought, and uh, uh, now I'll move on to presenting a, a case study, a use case on what incident preparedness and disconnection could really mean in practice. So there was a customer uh, that contacted us and gave us a challenge. Uh, they had an offshore rig that was due to an upgrade of their existing safety and automation system. And they wanted uh, Mnemonic to help them looking into what more security features they could build into this. Because most offshore installations, they are purchased from a vendor and it comes with uh, five to some more years of warranty uh, where the vendor is responsible for the system. 
And during this time period, it's very hard to come dragging with new components for security and ask to have this installed into the configuration. So unless you have done your work during procurement, you are sort of stuck with having to deal with system as it is during this warranty period in many cases. But in this case, the customer's warranty period was over. So the Mammonic team was able to go in and build some security and incident preparedness into this installation in the form of a big red button. So the case study was building a big red button uh, to build a solution enabling offshore personnel to control remote access into the safety and automation system. So the Norwegian Petroleum Safety Authority, they noted in 2018 that the, the industry was becoming increasingly dependent on digital systems along the entire value chain and has since then launched several projects that has focused on digital technology and cybersecurity and their effect on health, safety, and environment risk. Uh, the ongoing digitalization of offshore installations involves the introduction of new technologies and tools to replace, streamline, and automate expensive manual and physical tasks offshore. And integrated operations have, have been around since maybe 2005 uh, or earlier. Uh, it allows for a greater degree of remote control, automation, collaboration between on and offshore personnel, as well as allowing for remote access to different subsystems offshore in an orderly manner. So the trends of integrated operations and digitalization offshore uh, provides great benefits and challenges for the well-established health, safety, environment regime on offshore installations. Uh, by allowing onshore operators to perform tasks on the offshore system, operators can save money, time compared to shipping personnel offshore for minor tasks on physical system, like, for instance, uh, uh, doing a small uh, adjustment of the firewall to disconnect remote uh, connections. Uh, in case you want to, you know, Segregate the network in an, uh, in part of an incident response. So, um, the HSE thinking is very ingrained into offshore personnel, and um, but this collides somewhat with the idea of someone accessing safety critical system from a remote location. So, also during an emergency involving IT systems such as ransomware spreading. There is a need to safely remove this remote access and to separate the critical IT systems from the remotely accessible network. So this became our challenge, build a solution for controlling the access to the critical SAS system offshore that can be operated by offshore personnel that had little to no in-depth security knowledge. Uh, so this video drawing was what the Mnemonic team was met with and the starting point for the implementation. So in this figure, the uh, SAS system vendor topology is anonymized and the levels that are indicated here are comparable to the zones in the IC62443. Uh, that uh, if you're working in I, uh, ICS, you, you know this, uh, this uh, framework. And if you are technically inclined, you're probably diving into this drawing right now. <laughs> um, first thing you might see is a lot of dual homing um, without bastion hosts which is apparently still a thing. So all system here, systems here are interconnected with the different levels on redundant networks. And there's also a vendor specific network redundancy protocol running on the operating system that allows for lossless failover between the A and B networks. Uh, there was a firewall that was the vendor delivered uh, that uh, our team got to take a more thorough look at. And it turned out to be mainly an address translation device with some access list inbound filtering and very little outbound filtering. And the packet filter had a very static and quite open rule base, and there were no logging or audit files. I also, mean, all yeah. systems are joined to one domain. So we have a standard uh, Active Directory domain that all systems are connected to. Cool. So from a cybersecurity perspective, uh, this architecture is perfect for potential threat actors lateral movement, right? Uh, but it turns out this is a very standard type of topology for installations like this offshore. So our OT security experts, they started questioning some of this network architecture. There are some outbound sessions that must be allowed, but maybe not all of this dual homing is necessary. So we started looking into the IT related parts of this uh, SAS system first, uh, because we really didn't want to break any of the control system features. So the starting point was to look at the systems that were dual home both into the process control network and the remote access network. 
Of course, the remote access network on an offshore installation is really secure. You have to jump through quite a few hoops in order to get there. But still, we thought that this could be done better. So we started by identifying components that could be removed from the remote accessible networks, uh, performing an old school sounds and conduit analysis. We figured that for the domain controllers, there was really no need for them to be remotely accessible. And the same went for the several of the SAS supporting servers. Uh, so after discussing this with the vendor, we were allowed to remove several of these from the remote access network. And after breaking these connections, most of the critical systems for the process control network only resides on the process control network. Right. Uh, there are still some challenges. Uh, there were some open connections that are necessary, so the you cannot really have any air gaps. Uh, Sorry, Mary Mo, we have three minutes left. Um, then three minutes we have left. To, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. We won't I'm have almost any at the time. closing here. Yep. <laughs> so yeah. we we had to do some security controls that could not affect any control functions. So yeah. So after some time, we ended up with removing all the Northbound connections uh, from the domain controllers and several uh, supporting SAS systems. So this is. Uh, the the segregated uh, network, and uh, this uh, we decided that then to build some extra protections for for the system that still needed to have some remote access, and the protection layer is a firewall uh, between those systems that need to be remotely accessible, and the rest of the control systems are then beyond this firewall. So this was implemented on layer two with layer filtering, cluster configuration, with threat detection, threat prevention capabilities, and so on. And also this gave us the opportunity of getting actually some logs uh, created and uh, then exported to the SOC for analysis. So there's a great uh, you know, uh, improvement of security by adding this firewall. So this is the result that we ended up in the, in the, with in the end. So no, the only challenge that remained was to empower the operators to change the access in, in case there was an incident. So how did this, uh, this, uh, uh, this happen? Uh, we looked in the API of the firewall and we made this, uh, uh, these three different uh, firewall policies. So you have three options and it's really easy to change between them. Uh, you just do this by uh, touching uh, this uh, touch panel. So this is the actual red button, how it looks like. It was implemented on a touch screen that was installed in the cabinet on the oil platform, uh, where operators with no or little training could easily you know, uh, change the firewall policy. Okay, okay, so the takeaways is that, you know, operationalization of the CERT alerts and warning is still a work in progress. Uh, it's feasible to implement better operational procedures for securing all the systems. And when an incident occurs, you need to be prepared to press the red, big red button in a safe manner, of course, segregating the networks uh, so that you could perform uh, incident procedures. So thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for everybody to participate in, in this interesting talk. We have no um, uh, more time left uh, for questions and answers. We had one question and it was answered uh, during your talk. So thank you okay. very much. Have a good day and see you in the next. Bye-bye. Okay. Uh, Bye-bye.